Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode five of our PBR TV live sessions to keep voting alive. This evening, we're going to be joined again by Paul Glatzel of Powerboat Training UK to talk everything VHFs. Now, we touched on this on our um, safety tips and things when we were talking about returning back to voting after the COVID-19 lockdown period. However, we're going to expand on this particular segment this evening and cover off a, a variety of topics. So we'll bring Paul in and we will start the show. Hi, Tom. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? Thanks for joining us this evening again. Uh, I hear you've had quite an eventful day on the water. Uh, yeah, one of the things I, I get to do is uh, be duty launch authority or one of the duty launch authorities at Paul Lifeboat Station. And uh, we were paged at about 20 past one and by 20 past four when the boats were back in and returned uh, ready for service, we'd undertaken seven uh, seven shouts, as we'd call them. So in a two and a half hour period, uh, we think that's probably a bit of a record, um, certainly for Paul anyway. And, and in those shouts, uh, were they people in distress or were they people that just hadn't prepared their boats properly or are there, are there things that we can learn from in those shouts? Uh, I think, uh, thankfully, there was nothing hugely serious in those, although we obviously saw over the weekend some, some very serious incidents at the likes of Durdle Door. Uh, but boat breakdowns, a uh, couple of jet skis broken down, a couple of power boats broken down. I think uh, it's the start of the season, late in the season, as we've said before. And I think people just need to maybe sort of hold back in terms of where they're going with their boat, check it's running, maybe just use it around the marina and go with a buddy uh, because uh, then you've got some backup on hand. Yeah, that enthusiasm to obviously get out to the start of the season is obviously amplified by the fact we've all been under lockdown. So it's uh, really need to make sure that our boats are ready to go to sea before uh, obviously risking other people as well. Um, so uh, this evening, we're going to talk about a variety of different things VHF related. Um, we've got on our topic list things to, uh, regarding licenses. Um, we'll be going back and covering uh, DSC a little bit further, um, uh, the various different channels and, and uh, what they, what they mean and what you use them for, um, how we do radio checks, um, looking at the technology in the future, um, how we can improve our range, um, because I see so many ribs and power boats that are rigged um, by the sort of uh, local dealer or distributor for a particular brand or whatever, and sometimes that may not be the, the, um, the normal setup out of the factory, may not be the ideal setup for your type of boating. So there's some things to, to look at there. Um, and we've also got some other little uh, tips and tricks as well. So um, should we start off with uh, the licenses section? So, you know, what, what licenses do we need, if any? I know we touched on this before, but some people may have not uh, watched the previous episode. So let's start off with that yeah. one. Yeah, it's, it's ironic that uh, we go to sea as a leisure boater in the UK with a sub 24 metre boat and we're not required to have a licence to to helm the craft, yet you are required to have a license for the radio, be it a handheld here or I've got a fixed set as well. Um, and basically you have two types of licenses. You have the license relating to the set, um, and uh, we'll look at that in a bit more detail, but we've either got a handheld or we have a fixed radio, or we could have both on a boat, and we didn't need a license for that. Now, one of the great things is that's now free. Uh, the government gives it to us free as long as we're prepared to do it online, and that's done through the Ofcom website. And it's just nowadays a nice, simple system of setting up an account, filling in your details, and you get issued a boat license via PDF. So that's dead easy. You need to keep it up to date, um, and you need to make sure that anything that's on the boat that transmits is on that license. So radar, uh, if you've got transmitting AIS. Um, and do remember, if you add sub something subsequently, so maybe nowadays one of the easiest things to add is a radar because you can, you've can you got your multifunction Rain Marine or Simrad or Garmin, and then you can bolt on the, the radar at the top, um, and that can just be an add-on later. And that's a transmitting piece of kit, so it needs to be on your radio license. And there's a danger if you go abroad, you might get fined uh, for not having that license. Theoretically, it could be in the UK, but if you don't see it happening. And the other bit that needs a license is an operator on board. It doesn't need to be everybody. And basically, let's say I'm the qualified operator on the boat, I can delegate uh, to someone else on the boat to actually use that radio under my supervision. And that's a great thing to do because you can get kids using it, other people on the boat using it under my supervision. And they need a license and they get that through the RWA one day course. So um, when you get your license, uh, do you 
do you receive your call sign that way? Is that how you get your call sign and your MMSI? You know, those, those type of things that we want to sort of cover off. Yeah, so the call sign and the MMSI. So the call sign, your international call sign is a unique ID. So uh, one of mine will be something like Mike Golf to November Tango, something like that, five uh, numeric alpha um, sort of uh, code. Uh, then your MMSI, uh, your mo uh, Maritime Mobile Service Identity, it's a nine digit number. And the first three numbers, 235, 234, indicate your country. So we have 232 through to 235 in the UK um, or 225 in France. Um, and then the other numbers are your unique um, element for you. Um, and that you plug into your radio uh, to identify it as being having that MMSI number basically. And that sticks with the radio. You don't own that, it stays with the radio. So your call sign and MMSI get issued by Ofcom as a product of issuing you that radio license. Okay, so when we, um, well, I'll, I'm going to ask the question that I've got in mind, but we'll, we'll follow on uh, with the rest of the topic first. So on to the digital uh, selective calling. Can you kind of explain a little bit about what that is and um, yeah, how, how it's used on board? Yeah, so the DSC, I think it's helpful to have the opportunity to get across the benefits of it. So. Uh, we've got this radio, um, and you can see it's got a bit of a wire coming out the top here. Usually it would have a little stubby aerial, um, and it's just got this wire because it's, it's set up as a training radio. But basically, we've got this handheld radio here, um, and we're used to seeing people put it to their mouth and talk and, and have voice contact uh, between radios. What digital selective calling is, is a mechanism within the radio where we can effectively have one radio transmit a signal uh, via, VH, via the VHF signal, but effectively a digital signal to another radio. And it's using those MMSI numbers to do it. So what sort of things can it do? Well, the most obvious one is that we can issue distress with it. So on the back of this little handheld, just where my finger is, there's a little red uh, button there, a little flap. We can pull it down and there's a button underneath that and we can press and hold that and we can issue distress with that. Um, so. The question you might ask is, well, how often do people use that as a, as a technique? Um, not, not so often, but actually, if they're in proper distress, really, they should do. And the reason is, so let's say you're sitting there, Tom, and maybe you've changed your radio to channel six because you're speaking to a couple of other boats in the powerboat and rib sort of fleet, and you've gone away from channel 16, which is the cooling and distress channel. Let's say you turned the volume down on your radio. Let's say you'd gone away from the radio and if you had uh, heads on your boat, you were down in the head somewhere. So basically you're not hearing what that radio is doing. If I transmitted Mayday, 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 then you wouldn't hear any of that. You're on the wrong channel or not on the right channel for it. The volume was down on the radio and you weren't at the radio. But if I go red button push distress, irrespective of that, your radio is going to make a real racket. Um, so it's one of those things and we can do it uh, in a moment and, and sort of show how that actually works that's a really good benefit because when things are seriously hit the fan you want as many people to know as possible so dsc can do that it can send other sorts of alerts for uh, what are known as urgency announcements uh, which relate to pan pan calls um, safety announcements relating to security calls, and then routine. We can just do ship-to-ship -ship communications and establish contact between you and me using the digital side of the radio. And all of that happens in the background, and it doesn't take up the core calling channel of Channel 16. Would you say um, there are some cons to DSC, though? I know um, some handheld VHS, for example, the, the battery life is um, uh, vastly different um, compared to a traditional just handheld standard VHF. Um, can you talk us through some of, the, yeah, some of the cons as well? Yeah, so it's a good question. So we've got basically here two radios. We've got an ICOM M71, um, now it's the model number, I think it's M73, and we've got the M91 DSC unit here, and there's a later model. Both from uh, ICOM models, um, that's the one I tend to use regularly. It doesn't have DSC and the battery life's huge. I'll, I'll charge it and probably leave it for two, three, sometimes four weeks. If I'm transmitting lots on it, that will chew the battery. But most of the time we're on the receive. With this, because DSC requires uh, a GPS position, then the unit is constantly seeking its position from uh, satellites and therefore that's just going to use more more battery power. So therefore the battery life on these doesn't tend to be as good 
as these. Now, which ones you go for? Well, it depends. Um, for me, this is my personal radio that sits on my life jacket um, and it stays there the whole time. And I want to be able to issue distress from the water if needs be or to contact um, a marina from just my handheld. This, uh, you know, if you're in a small boat and you can't justify having a fixed set or if you're a kayaker, um, then a great piece of kit. And it may well be that that more limited battery life is actually acceptable for the benefit of having DSC. Is there a cost difference between a, a standard handheld and then upgrading to a, a DSC? Yeah, so this one, uh, I think nowadays are about £250. Uh, standard Horizon, the ICOM do very similar sets. Um, this one, this is at the top end of the handheld non-DSC range, and it's probably about 180 190 but you can come down with a more standard icon one for about 120 130 so uh, realistically one of these about half the price of one of these um, and there isn't a right or wrong you know if you've got a fixed set great insurance policy backup because the great thing is um, that it's not reliant on the battery of the boat so for example there was a boat towed in by the lifeboat last night and then it had sunk all its electrics were gone so therefore by definition it wasn't going to have its fixed vhf uh, set. So actually having that on your person um, was really key. And personally, you know, it's one thing to think about, where do you put this? Because for me, on my life jacket the whole time is, is where I put it just in case I enter the water. Um, so somebody's got their their new VHF uh, fixed or handheld, um, or they've, they've picked up their new boat if they're new to boating, if they're following their boating series. How do they actually seek assistance? And uh, there are obviously different methods and different severities of you know, calling in an emergency, etc. So can you talk us through the difference between Pan Pan and Mayday and Securite and, and their um, uh, calling up, say, for example, a marina for a berth? Yeah, absolutely. So a good variety of different uses for the radio there. So um, if we start and think, firstly, we've got the VHF, sorry, the voice mechanism of contact, um, and we've just talked about DSC. So we've got the option to initiate contact via DSC, via that a digital system and then follow it through with voice afterwards and as i said you know if you've got a serious situation then i would strongly advise you to use that dsc element so let's say something does go wrong and you, and you asked about those sort of grades of issue we've all heard the word mayday and hopefully we've all heard the words pan pan um, mayday means help me in french um, and mayday's top of the pile grave and imminent danger to life vessel vehicle or aircraft and you need that immediate assistance don't worry about the strict definition. If you feel someone's in real serious danger on your boat um, and it's about your boat, uh, then go with a mayday. I'm really keen for people not to beat themselves up about was it a mayday, is it a mayday? And I'm very keen actually for people who sit behind keyboards not to criticise others for the call they made. Um, it's very easy to do that. It's very different when something's going wrong, your kids are in danger. Um, you made the call you need to. But technically, Mayday's right up there in terms of loss or life or vessel. Level below that is Pan Pan. Um, and Pan, uh, Pan means broken in French, broken boat or broken person, basically. Uh, so it's not quite as urgent, but you do need assistance. And Pan Pan is that way to call. Um, and if we have a, just a look at those in terms of how you make the call, and then we can come on to uh, to Securité as well. So, uh, so the Mayday call, um, I've got my... Uh, radio, I'm just going to switch on uh, a set here. He says, hopefully, which doesn't then switch on. So I've got the other one switched on. Um, and I'm going to switch on my little handheld here. And I've got this button at the back. And nowadays it's moved on. We, we, it always used to be sort of press and hold for five seconds, um, the, the button. Um, there are some slight differences between radio sessions. You need to read your instructions. It's not something we're all very good at. But some radios require you to press it, release, press and hold. Others just press and hold, read the manual, basically, because the time to learn it is not when you really need it. Um, on this one, I press and hold it, and it's going into countdown. And this is where we hope everything's connected, and it all worked absolutely fine earlier, and then doesn't. Uh, so the other radio is now beeping very, very loudly. Um, and let's just try that. There we go. So, 
I'll be worried there for a moment. Um, but basically, it was just a little bit of a delay as the signal goes down and, and into the radio. Um, and you can see that loud signal is really going to grab attention. And then you're going to go mayday, 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 mayday. And there's an international structure, a legal structure for that call. But uh, I remember speaking to the Coast Guard a few years ago, and um, they said no one ever gets the mayday call perfect because they're too stressed at the time. But make sure you've got a mayday card at your helm position. I would recommend laminated mayday cards and then a china graph or a little permanent marker in a book that you can make a note of other people's maydays um, and then you i think also yeah. just just following your point there that um having the yeah, little laminated thing or um a permanent marker or something with your call sign next to the vhf as well because when you're um I, i've had it where uh, i was doing a delivery on um a princess and the um uh, customer boat was doing a, a part exchange and I was bringing the old boat back um, and that had some mechanical issues at sea and um, uh, they put the um, uh, call sign in the boat um, and it was all there ready to go everything was uh, correct so that the, the Coast Guard could get the right details of that boat for assistance um, so having having those things when you're in a stressful environment um, something's gone wrong, you don't plan for it to go wrong, um, it's going to really be able to help um, with getting some assistance, isn't it, by having it right to hand. Absolutely, and, and it's really good practice, so that's, that's, you know, that's good. And if you're, you know, you talk about being a delivery skipper or jumping boat to boat, just having a little grab bag and just having that in there, a laminated sheet, you could show somebody else that you're going boating with, here it is, if I get into trouble, you do this with the radio, here's the Mayday card. Um, and actually just putting the MM, doing your own one and having your own MMSI number, uh, call sign, or if it's like you as a delivery skipper, having a little um, blank bit, and then on the boat you go on to, you actually write it in there. And I go on loads of boats, and one of the first things I do is just test the DSC just by pressing gently the red button once, and it will say no MMSI quite often. Nowadays they tend to say them on the outside of the radio, so it's amazing the number of boats that have a DSC radio but have never programmed the MMSI number, which is before we move on from the DSC section, if, say, for example, a child on board has got hold of your handheld VHF and presses that uh, distress button, you can cancel it, can you? Yeah, you can. Um, the reality is you're not going to do it quickly enough. Um, the, the reality is it will go through to the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard would acknowledge. And then the Coast Guard really want to know, was it a mayday that you think's fixed? Um, and actually, you might be wrong and, and perhaps you do need assistance. Um, so the reality is contact the Coast Guard um, and if you look at the books on VHF or the RWA course, it will talk about the mess message to cancel a mayday and you need to fess up to the Coast Guard and tell them basically. Yeah. Um, so moving on from DSC, how else Yeah, can we seek assistance? And, and especially maybe if you're not in an emergency situation, we've touched on, you know, Nobody really does a, a mayday perfectly in a stressful environment. Um, the pan pan, and then also you've got security and, and other forms of communication on the VHF. Yeah, so the, the pan pan, as we said, something's broken. Um, and uh, basically, you can do that via a DSC announcement, an urgency announcement. So you have to go through the menu structure of the radio and find that again, read the instructions. Do your DSC announcement, uh, your DSC urgency announcement, and then back it up with a pan pan call. Perhaps laminated one side mayday, the other side pan pan, um, and you go through that call structure, which is pretty much the same as a mayday. And then the coast guard will contact you and provide assistance. What a security call is is slightly different, though. Um, security call is about telling other people that something's a problem. Uh, it's not someone in distress so much as it could be a submerged log or a container or something basically they need to be aware of. And the reality is for us as leisure boaters, we shouldn't really need to do that. If you do see something floating that needs looking at, you could put a security call out, but the reality is the Coast Guard's going to need to deal with it. So you're better off just making a call to the Coast Guard, telling them about it, and then they will choose what they do. But you could find it maybe uh, vessels with divers down, military vessels doing target practice would put security calls out, vessels doing uh, depth soundings, they'd put security calls out to alert. Um, so, you know, be aware of what they are, uh, but it's fairly unlikely you'd have a need to do one. So we, on previous episodes, been talking about the Navionics app 
and the benefits of, of that. And also in an almanac, you will see, um, so whether you, you're using the iPad or iPhone and you, you click on the marina or whatever, or the same in the almanac, it will give you uh, a channel number, um, channel 12 or whatever it may be. Um, can you talk us through uh, what channels we do use for communication and why uh, channel 80 is a little bit different? Yeah, so great question. Um, it's one of the things when you switch your radio and you go, brilliant, loads of channels. And then you start flicking through them and you don't really hear very much. Um, and the reality is, whilst we have quite a lot of channels on our radio, very few of them are actually usable by us. Um, so the main channel is channel 16, the International Calling and Distress Channel. And that we have an obligation uh, to leave on and to, to monitor because we've got that legal obligation to potentially uh, respond to a distress situation. So 16 is, is one you'd listen to. If you're down south, um, then Solent Coast Guard monitor channel 67. And if you've got a non-urgent call, then they want that call, uh, contact direct with them on 67. And then you mentioned the Almanac and various different ports and harbours are on various different channels. So for example, if you're going to uh, Portsmouth, Queen's Harbour Master there is on channel 11. And if you go into the harbour, and you do something wrong, they're going to they're gonna be on your back. You need to know what the rules are. And, and if you want to go into the harbour and then turn uh, right to Gun Wharf as you go in, then you actually need permission to do that. So various harbours will have various different channels. Um, so you'd need potentially to know those. If you're going to speak to another boat, then if you haven't made contact via DSC, it's going to be uh, via channel 16. And then you've only got four working channels, 6, 8, 72 and 77. And they're the only channels we should be doing ship-to-ship -ship communication on. You've got a few other channels, and you mentioned Channel 80. That's the, the marina channel. And in the UK, there's two main um, channels you'll use for speaking to somewhere that's going to have berths. One will be a yacht club, and most yacht clubs will be on 37 Alpha, which is a private UK channel. So it's only available on UK radios. Um, and then you've got Channel 80. And what's a bit different about 80 is the next time you go out, turn on to Channel 80 if you're in a busy area. It won't work if you're not in a busy area with lots of marinas. And listen and see what you hear. All you will hear is marinas. You will never hear boats on Channel 80. And the reason for that is when we're going to contact a marina, when we talk, we transmit on one frequency and the marina listens on that frequency. But when they talk, they transmit on a different frequency and our radio is programmed to listen on that frequency. So it means all the boats speak down one channel and all the marinas speak down another. So when we're going to speak to a marina, we need to be quite careful. We need to get onto 80, shut up, and see if anyone else is chatting on that channel. And you will only hear the marina side of the, the conversation. So leave it, leave it for a minute or two. If there's no comms on 80, Kopsky Marina, Kopsky Marina, this is Harrier, Harrier over. And then the marina will come back to you um, and you'll hear them fine and you'll hear any other marina fine, but you'll never hear other boats on Channel 80. Yeah, for the new boater as well, would you, when you're, say, coming into a marina, would you necessarily be calling up using your call sign when you're just wanting a bird or would you refer to the boat name? Yeah, I, I mean, you could technically use your call sign, you could use your MM sign number, but the reality is you're going to use your vessel name. A uh, little tip, though, if you really want to get into a marina, don't use the radio at all. Call them up uh, on the mobile phone because you, you might be able to schmooze them by saying, actually, I'm only 16 foot. I'm sure you can sneak me in somewhere. Whereas over the radio, they might have to say, we're completely full um, and we can't let you in because they don't want everybody else hearing that they've snuck you in. So um, I'm not saying that's necessarily a uh, perfect practice, but it's a good way of getting into a tight, busy marina. And also uh, just calling ahead, just common courtesy to the marina operator, especially on a busy summer, um, booking a space if you can, or when you've done that passage plan that we were talking about last week, um, maybe notifying them that you're, you're planning to stop there for lunch or something. Absolutely, yeah. and, and and that's a good one, Tom, in terms of short stay births. You know, marinas will love you popping in for a couple of hours, putting some money in the local restaurants or the bar that they might have on site, and they'll generally charge you five, 10 pounds for what's called a short stay berth. Uh, there's people here in Paul who come from Cobbs Key and they go to the marina on the quay. Uh, it's about a mile away, uh, but it's lovely. You know, it's like a day trip out. You go to the marina, you go to the restaurants on the quay and you've gone by boat. Um, so it doesn't need to be far and it's it's just something a bit different. Uh, you mentioned uh, briefly uh, 6-7. So obviously when somebody calls up 16, they may, for the first time, uh, they may not be expecting to change channel, etc. So can you just quickly, I know it's similar to channel 80 and freeing up channel 16, but can you just 
reiterate um, the procedure there so people are familiar? Yeah, absolutely. So when you make initial contact via 16 with the Coast Guard, say, it might be Solon Coast Guard, Solon Coast Guard, this is Harrier, Harrier, over. Um, and the Coast Guard will come back to you, Harrier, Solon Coast Guard, 67, and await my call, over. And what they're saying is go to 67 and then please just sit there and don't say a word. So the obligation on you then is to move to 67 and to shut up because you don't know how many other calls they've got stacked on 67. Some of, my, some of them might be quite urgent um, and they just want you to go and sit there. If you sit there for 10, 15 minutes and you don't get a call back, you might be leave another five minutes and go back to 16 and call them again. But the reality is it can easily take a few minutes for them to call you and you won't necessarily hear those other calls because it could be speaking to a boat that's some distance away from you that's just simply too far away for you to hear. And also, obviously, if they're dealing with a mayday, that will take uh, priority because you'd be entering that call with mayday rather than just calling up the, the Coast Guard and then being put in. Town, so. Yeah, absolutely. And you'll hear the Coast Guard when it's dealing with a mayday. Uh, they might say, you know, sort of, mayday top hat. This is Solon Coast Guard. And they're putting the word mayday before top hat simply to flag up on channel 16 please keep quiet we're mayday working on this channel yeah okay great um so why should people use uh low power when transmitting because you would see maybe a vhf a handheld vhf for the first time and see high low and you know you may think oh, well, i want more power yeah absolutely so basically you you've got two things that influence your range, and we'll come back to antennas and that in, in a moment. Um, your the power setting on your radio, high and low power, uh, has a has a sort of a small element that has an uh, an interest in sort of range. But the fundamental issue is it allows more people to use the radio in your vicinity. So let's imagine uh, you and I, Tom, we're, we're we're in your room there that I can see, which is quite grand and large. Um, and let's say we go down towards the sofa, and you and I just speak really quietly and we have a conversation really quietly. Well, elsewhere in that room, there could be other pairs of people having a really quiet conversation, no problem at all. And that's the equivalent of speaking to another station on low power. If we go in on high power, 25 watts for a fixed set, about five or six watts for a, a handheld set, then it's the equivalent of me going in shouting really loudly. So we're down on that sofa again, and we're sh I'm shouting really loudly at you, and that's making it really difficult for other people to have the conversation in the room. Now, actually, with radios, it's even worse than that because radios are programmed to listen to the loudest signal. So those other pairs of people dotted around your room that were having a, a nice, quiet conversation, whereas in our brains, we could perhaps filter the objectionable loud me out, those radios can't. They have to tune in to the loudest signal. So suddenly, those conversations can't happen. So effectively... Um, low power gives an opportunity for more uh, pairs of people, of, of us to a particular organisation or marina or such like, to have a conversation in the same vicinity um, at low power. And then if we can't get hold of them via low power, we switch to high power. So would you use uh, high power in a mayday situation? You want the biggest voice? Is, is, is that the logic behind that? Yeah, and that's a great way to think of it. Think of it, you want to shout loudly because you want to be heard. So before a mayday distress situation or maybe a pan pan, then get to, get to high power because you want to be heard straight away. Um, so how can we improve our range? We're, we're, we're going to, obviously, in this, we want to talk about our antennas, et cetera. So is, is that the, the biggest mistake that you see on, on boats that are, maybe you've got a, a lovely 30 power boat, but you then got the, the little short stubby, uh, I think it's Shakespeare the, um, brand or something, but um, they're great for their purposes, but sometimes you see them on boats that are, could be going off to the channel lines, etc. as well. Yeah, I mean, you do see some short stubby aerials. There's basically the length of the aerial is linked to the wavelength of the signal. And, you know, there's a sort of, a, you know, not necessarily the longer the better, but, you know, the bigger that you can have within reason works better in terms of, um, you know, picking up that signal but what it really comes down to is antenna height and it's all about getting your antenna high so if we've got a little handheld here by definition it's about two meters off the ground when we talk it's a short stubby area as well if we could get it high we can get more range um, and therefore yachts with their antennas at the top of the mast uh, or bigger power boats are going to get more range and actually the coast guard's the best example because it puts its area on the top of cliffs 
Um, and there's basically a calculation um, that you can say the height of the aerial um, basically has a, a distance you can calculate that that can go. And then, the, so if we've got the Coast Guard aerial and we've got this aerial, um, then you've got two calculations, how far this can transmit, how far the Coast Guard can transmit, and the sum of the two is how far away you're going to be heard. But I'd sort of tend to say a handheld, maybe a few miles. Um, if you're looking at a smaller powerboat, you might get four to five miles, and then the higher those aerials get, the further you're going to get. I'd say also to make sure, uh, we talked about checking the kill cord as part of our safety um, uh, checks before jumping onto our boat and going to sea. Um, but there are a number of times where I've, I've jumped on a boat and the VHF doesn't work, the coax is, is all rusty or uh, something's happened. So um, how do we, we're going to go onto our radio checks, but are there some other things we should also be looking at to make sure that our, our range, and I, I know uh, we've got uh, the handheld and also the mic set. If that gets clogged with water, especially in an offshore environment, you need to blow that out, eh? Yeah, absolutely. So you get now on some of the radios what are called quake functions, I think it is, where you press a button and it vibrates madly to try and get the water out of the handset. Uh, we sort of, as, as instructors, have a technique which is to bang it hard against the wall or a hard object with the sort of mic fit down, and that seems to work as well. It's sort of not necessarily great for the radio, but uh, it seems to survive it. I mean, the other thing, you mentioned anything else there, that, Tom, that contributes to this is actually thinking about the angle of your antenna. Um, and basically, with antennas, you get different ratings in terms of gain. And gain, basically, is a measure of the way that the signal propagates horizontally. Um, and you see a mistake on power boats a lot of the time, which is if you think of the antenna, um, then that's pretty vertical at the moment. And the sort of um, antenna you get on power boats should have a pretty good horizontal Gain. So pretty much um, imagine a donut around uh, my arm. If they angle it like that to look sporty. <laughs> so if it goes down like that to look sporty, then the signal's going up there and down into the sea the other way. So if you look at lifeboats, then life, if, if, the bow, if that's raked back in the sort of sexy sort of way, then lifeboats, if the bow is over here, lifeboats will have their angles raked slightly forward such that when they come up on the plane, they go vertical. Um, and sailing boats have uh, different gains as well because their antenna could be all over the place according to a healing, just like a handheld. Um, and they have a, a, an antenna that therefore is designed to propagate pretty much the same horizontally irrespective of the angle. Um, so have a look at that the next time you're out, particularly the big lifeboats, you'll see the way their an antennas are angled. Yeah. So you've, uh, you're pretty confident you've got a, a good antenna to suit your boating needs. You've got your new bit of kit. You've got your uh, uh, radio license. Um, so how can we do our radio checks? What's the proper procedure now before we go to sea? Uh, well, it is good to check your radio, uh, to check your radio works. Um, and here I'm going to sort of like just plead uh, with those listening for just maybe some common sense here. Uh, because this weekend's been, for the Coast Guard and the lifeboats, massively busy ridiculously busy uh, but the number of people who are doing radio checks on channel 16 and seem to do it every week is just bonkers um, so yes check your radio but try and maybe check it on a less busy day or a less busy time check maybe with the marina or the local harbour control or actually a really great one now is national coast watch now i think they're just reopening after the lockdown but uh, nci on channel 65 are more than happy to do radio checks with you uh, so it is good to do radio checks. There's certainly no point doing it with your mate on the boat next door because, you know, a tin can is going to be able to transmit that far. Uh, so you need a reasonable amount of distance and do check. But I don't think it really needs checking every week. Um, start of the season, maybe a couple of months into the season for a radio check. Something like that seems reasonable. I mean, if you're using the radio regularly, then by definition, it's fine. Do beware, though, because... A radio could be working perfectly on receive when it doesn't need to use much power, but when you go to transmit, it could be a problem. One of my radios, actually, a couple of weeks ago, I pressed transmit on it and it just switches off. Uh, so it was absolutely fine on receive. As soon as you went to transmit, it drops out. So that will just get sent back to ICOM and they'll do their stuff as they always do and send it back fully fixed. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's worth checking. So um, also with handhelds, checking the batteries then and making sure that they're all charged 
Um, there's different uh, methods. I know you can have a solid state battery pack that slides in, same as uh, like a drill, like a lithium battery. Um, there's, they also do one which is a cassette, the same shape, but you can put uh, AAs or AAAs into it. Um, and then you've got the, the charging dock for charging that uh, lithium or solid state battery. Um, so it's really important, like you say, um, I've got a, a handheld downstairs, which I've completely got to bring up with me. Um, but it's one that's just in the house as a spare. And I turned it on today to see if it was working and I haven't used that in a year and it still powers up and it's, it's all fine. However, I wouldn't really want to go to sea with that without making sure it's been charged overnight. Otherwise, it could be having a little bit of a sheet. Yeah, what I would do with that, Tom, is actually, because you'll switch it on and the battery level will be perfect, mm. um, what I would do is just change maybe to channel 15 or 17, so just away from 16, and then just key it. Um, and just see, sometimes that will just crash the battery because that little bit of transmit will just take up so much that you'll suddenly see actually the battery is shot. We do need to recharge. Whereas actually, if after a couple of quick clicks, it's held, uh, it's power, it might be all right uh, in the short term. Cool. Um, so where do we see the technology going? I'm, I'm going to be talking to Simrad tomorrow at 2 p.m. to go through their latest array of kit, and there's a, a, a VHF in there. But where, where do you see um, uh, technology going in the future? Well, I think it's it's if you look at the likes of Simrad, Raymarine, Garmin, the multifunction displays they've got, then it's just gone on leaps and bounds and the chart plotters have. The reality is with radio, I'm certainly not aware of any major changes heading our way in terms of the channels, the DSC side of things. And, and it's so difficult for that to change because it's embedded around the world and it's the same technology that works everywhere. Where it is changing though, I think, is your finding in terms of the size of the sets and the way they're actually integrated into the helm position. In that you're seeing, for example, ICOM with a, a, a unit that can go behind the console and then you just have a small mic, but you've got the benefits of a fixed set with a very small mic. Um, if you look at the big lifeboats nowadays, um, their VHF systems integrated into a touch screen display and you're starting to see that with the more mainstream Raymarine Garmin and Simrads again. So I think what you're likely to see is a sort of a, a handset, but then with a lot of the functionality of the VHF potentially within the touchscreen. Um, but at the end of the day, um, a VHF doesn't take up too much space, um, and it's quite nice to have it as a distinct unit that absolutely works. One, one tip on it, though, that where, where we have seen it move over the last few years is it always used to be the case you had to plug your fixed GPS unit, sorry, correction, your fixed uh, VHF unit into a GPS feed to get the latitude and longitude through. Nowadays, all the radios I buy, uh, the fixed set for boats, I always make sure they've got GPS built in because why go through the hassle of having a connection behind that could fail when you can put a GPS or for 10, 15 quid more, have a GPS unit in the radio and therefore it doesn't need that external connection. Um, I know that also a, a number of... Uh fixed units are now starting to integrate uh, AIS. Uh, the latest RS40B so from Simrad, which we're going to be covering off tomorrow, has got a built-in internal AIS transponder. Um, for those that may have not watched the previous episodes, we've touched on AIS before, but if somebody is looking at a VHF that's AIS compatible, um, what does that actually mean and, and what does AIS do? We'll just quickly cover so, up. Yeah, AIS uh, is a system based on the in the VHF um, radio band, basically, and it's automatic identification system. So it's basically a transponder system. The two types of AIS fundamentally we have, which is just a receiver unit. We can see other people's um, signal or we can actually see it and we can transmit our own. Um, and a great way for anyone to go and have a look at this is you just go and have a look at marinetraffic.com. Um, and basically, it's a group of enthusiasts around the world who receive AIS signals and put it out onto the web for you. Um, and what should scare you beyond belief is the number of boats around uh, the world um, and certainly the number of boats going up and down the English Channel if you're thinking about crossing. Um, but AIS on your boat and built into the radio, I think if it is built into the radio, that's fine. But I would hope those radios are then feeding that signal in a usable way through to a chart plotter. Because I've certainly seen some radios where they represent it on a little tiny LCD screen. And I look at that and frankly, I cannot work out what it's doing. Whereas if it's pushing it through to a chart plotter, 
where it's much more visual, that's good. And it will give you basically the boat's MMSI number, um, it will give you its course and its speed and then start to calculate whether there's a risk of collision potentially. So it's really, really good. But do remember anyone can switch off AIS. Uh, so it's only those vessels that wish to be seen. Big ships do have an obligation to leave it on, uh, but you know, without question that occasionally they do switch it off and certainly warships will switch them off uh, when they don't wish to be seen. So AIS is great. I think if you're interested in that, have a look at marinetraffic.com. Um, because it's fascinating to see what's going on. You can see all the lifeboats, rescue helicopters, tugs, big ships, small ships moving around. So if a uh, fixed VHF has got AIS uh, built in or compatible, you want to make sure that it's a uh, method that is being able, able to get into its, uh, the, the NEMA 2000 backbone so that it can be fed into whatever brand of multifunctional displays, correct? Absolutely. I, I struggle to see why you would spend the money and just have a little, tiny little LCD screen on your radio. So like uh, radar so, like sort of looking. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, OK, so um, one thing I wanted to touch on was um, you see to the, to the Nebo, to you see various different types of handsets. You see the traditional sort of um, uh, handheld um, uh, sort of walkie talkie style or with a, a cord. And then you've got the more sort of traditional phone set and they've become more sleek in design. Is there any benefit over a particular design or, or ergonomic um, structure? No, I think it's you pay your money and takes your choice. You don't see too many nowadays with a telephone handset. That tends to be a commercial vessel type thing. Or oh, you can get, Raymarine certainly were doing sort of, you, you get ones with proper telephone type ones on a commercial base, and then you get ones which are sort of handsets, as you say, with the curly sort of cable. Um, they will do the same thing to the same standards, um, and their range is not governed by what they look like or who makes them. It's governed really by that aerial um, and how high you can get it and whether you bangle it correctly. So I would say a lot of the time it's going to come down to, um, you know, sort of which which system you're going to put in. Um, ICOM don't do chart plotter type stuff, so they're a radio specialist. Um, and they're developing various different form factor sizes of radios to actually uh, fit into to different boats. Uh, backup's very good from ICOM, from Garmin, and quite a few of the others. Uh, so I think it's sort of pays your money, takes your choice. Like anything, though, you can get sort of far cheaper ones, and the, particularly in open boats, open ribs, you want to be looking for waterproof uh, IP rated front ends to the radio. Certainly the ICOMs, the Garmin's, the Standard Horizons will, will have those IP ratings. But if that's important to you, make sure you've got that because otherwise that can be quite depressing fairly quickly when you trash your radio after a single trip out. Yeah, definitely. Um, just touching, we, we've already covered antennas, um, but to the new boater that may be um, looking I don't, I don't know, a 20 foot ski boat, for example. So then maybe they're um, coming out of pool and going to Old Harry and stuff. Do they need to then have a 10 foot massive offshore antenna? We don't want to make people sort of panic by and think that they've got the wrong kind of kit. So, what would you see as a, a suitable antenna size for, say, a little sports boat for, for day hopping on coastal yeah. boating versus somebody that wants to go further afield? Yeah, good question. I think the first decision is, do I have a handheld or do I have a fixed set? And a good rough sort of cutoff is if you're in a boat above 20 foot, you've probably got enough space to have a fixed set. Uh, below that, you're probably purely into the realms of handheld. And equally, it depends where you boat. If you boat in a very busy area like the Solent or Pool Harbour, then a handheld may well suffice. You boat west coast of Scotland where it's far quieter. Um, and the waters can be a lot more challenging, then you want really as much range as, as you can possibly get. In terms of what you're looking at antenna height, well, generally those sort of like um, the white antennas, GRP antennas, you get are about minimum six foot, and then you can go to plenty more than that. Six foot, eight foot, it's always suffice for the boat, so I've actually had got plenty, plenty good enough signal. Um, I think don't feel the need to push down the fixed route. Um, Get a handheld, uh, it can be a good, you know, nice, simple Christmas present. The benefit from a handheld can be, uh, whilst you can't transmit when you're ashore, uh, there's no reason why you can't, you know, when you go away uh, for the day, have your radio, switch it on and just listen and learn the sort of transmissions you're getting. You can set it up to uh, scan various channels and that can be a great thing to do. So I think, you know, for a lot of people, a handheld is the way in. Um, as they get above 20 foot, they might go fixed and then a handheld's a great uh, insurance policy on the fixed set. 
Great. Well, is there anything else that we should know about radios and are there any special little things that can be can be done or have we covered everything? Yeah, we pretty much covered everything. I think one of the things that uh, not all of us do very well, but maybe should learn to do is read the manual. Um, and I, I, you know, read the manuals of radios and go, really, can it do that? And one of the things I came across recently was that, let's say you're going out with a group of ribs from Powerboat and Rib, maybe there's five of you, then there's a system in some radios called polling request where you can actually just ping them a DSC um, announcement, alert, um, and the radio will receive it and send you back their position and represent that on your chart plotter. Um, and you can set that up so they don't even know you've done it. Uh, so that can be quite useful. Uh, things like group call functions, if you are running, you know, like when there was Round Island, one of the things you could have done is you can get a group call number from Ofcom, which says we're a member of the Powerboat and Rib, rib Group, say, put all those into the radios, and then you just send a single message and everybody's at radio alarms who is a member of that group. So those sort of things are covered off in the manual. Uh, the R-Way books, the R-Way course, which you can do both in a classroom for a day or you can do online and then do the exam in a classroom. Both of them, you know, great and, you know, very beneficial to do um, in loads of places providing that. What, what uh, entails in that radio course? I know we, we talked about licenses and Ofcom, et cetera, but somebody books with you or another R-Way A training centre to have that, that uh, VHF course. What does the day entail? Well, it's certainly a long day. Um, so it's, you know, it's a full day in the classroom then with an assessment at the end of the day. Uh, so, you know, quite often people start at nine in the morning and they might still be going at 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. Now, don't let that put people off um, because it's either a long day or two or three days. So you can make it work in a long day. And there's what, what it should be and what, you know, I would like to think all of the centres do really is lots of practice using the radio. And we've got training radios that we can press the buttons on and send DSC alerts and make calls on. Um, and no one hears them beyond those people in the classroom. And it's a great way to actually build confidence in terms of using the radio because that's one of the big things. People become slightly, slightly scared of picking up the radio and making a bit of a sort of an idiot of themselves. Well, they're not going to. We, we all get tongue-tied. We all do things wrong. We all come away from a radio call and think, oh, wish I'd done it better. Uh, so the course is great for giving people hands-on experience of using the radio. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Paul, again for um, your time this evening and for us to be able to talk everything uh, VHFs. We hope that you have uh, found it really useful. We've had people uh, from all over Europe and some from America are also tuning in. So it's great to be able to offer this PBR TV live session. Uh, if you haven't already, we are offering a free digital subscription to Powerboat and Rib, which means that you don't have to pop down to the news agents um, under COVID-19. So jump on to powerboatandrib.com and there you'll be able to download a free digital subscription. If you've got any RWA or training or safety um, questions, then direct them to Paul at Powerboat Training UK. And uh, we hope to see you next week where we'll be in for another instalment of our Powerboat training. So thank you, Paul, for your time again this evening. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining in. Absolute pleasure, Tom. Thanks.